If you will, please turn your Bibles with me to the book Colossians, if you're not already there. Colossians chapter 1, 9 through 11. 9 through 11. The Bible reads as follows. For this reason, Paul speaking here, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering. One of the most encouraging things for me, and I would dare to say for you, for us all, is to know that somebody is praying for you. Mm -hmm. Amen. It's a song that I love to sing, that I used to sing before. Somebody prayed for me, had me on their mind, right? Took the time to pray for me, right? I, just, I love that song, right? Our brothers pray for us, our sisters pray for us. And in John chapter 17, who prayed for us? Jesus prayed for us. So we are happy when there are those that are, people are praying for us. To know that there are individual members, individual saints within the congregation that's concerned about our well-being, concerned about our spiritual growth. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Colossae along with Timothy and made mention of their prayers for the church. And there were some specific things that he uh, talked about. The question this morning that I have for you and for myself is when... You pray for others. What do you ask God for on their behalf? When you pray for others, what do you ask God for on their behalf? Today's sermon is called, Somebody is Praying for Me. Somebody is Praying for Me. Here in chapter 1, the Apostle Paul is discussing thanksgiving. He's going to discuss with the church at Colossae about a number of things that's on his mind. He starts off in verse number 9. That's where we're going to start. And what he does is that he tells us, or tells them, the church, that you are always in our hearts. And we are constantly praying for you. Are you constantly praying for one another? Notice what he says in verse number 9. He says, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. Stop right there for a second. Now, what did Paul and Timothy heard that got their attention? Look at verse number 4. The Bible tells us that they heard of their faith. The Colossian, their faith in Christ and their love for the brethren. The church at Colossae had a strong faith. Amen. The church at Colossae had a strong love for one another. That those who came and visit could not help but to see it and talked about it. Verse 7 through 8, the Bible tells us that the person who told them was a man by the name of Epaphras. Epaphras went back and told Paul and Timothy about the wonderful things the Colossian church is doing. How they have great faith, great love. Can you imagine the conversation that Epaphras had with, with Brother Paul? Paul, have you heard about the church of Colossae? They have such strong faith in God. They have such strong love for one another. Their hospitality. Guess what? They took me out for lunch. <laughs> Praise the Lord. They're such an encouraging congregation. Epaphras could see their love. They could see their faith. Because 
Love and faith are attributes that's done by not our words, but by what? Our actions. Amen. In Mark chapter 2, we find the story of Jesus and the paralyzed man. The Bible tells us that while Jesus was in this house, he was preaching. Think about it, our church. It was crowded. A lot of people. And Jesus was preaching the word. And they brought a man that was paralyzed. And seeing that there was no room in the apartment or the, 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 the place that he was preaching, the house. What they did was they climbed up on the roof. And they let down the man in the midst of Jesus. The Bible tells in verse number 5. That when Jesus saw their what? Their faith. Oh yes. Faith is seen. When Jesus saw their faith, he says to the private man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus was able to see their faith. Their faith was being displayed. Amen. And that's because true faith will always be shown by its works. Amen. That's what James tells us, right? That faith without works is dead. And that's what was seen by the church at Colossae. What about love? In John chapter 13, verse number 35, Jesus says, By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you what? Love one another. So love, the love that we show one another, will proclaim to others that we are followers of Jesus Christ. When other people see us, they will know. They'll say, you know what, that person is different. Have, does anyone ever tell you that before? Are you a Christian? They could tell by what they see. Your actions. And that's exactly what the Colossian Christians were doing. Their faith, their love was not only being demonstrated by, by what they said, but by what they were doing. Amen. Epiphras Epper, saw it and he went back and told Paul and he told the brethren. Amen. The question I have for you this morning again is Can others see your faith? When a person comes in, can they see your faith? Can they see your love? That's how the Colossians were able to display their love. Can others see your love? Can others see your faith? The way how you worship God in spirit and in truth. The way how the word of God dwells in you richly as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart. Can, can, are you showing that? The way how you pray in the spirit with all kinds of prayers. When, when they visit and they come here and they see us, do they, do they see that brotherly love in the congregation? The way how we fellowship with one another. The concerns that we have for one another. The way how we show hospitality. I can say that, yes, East Flushing Church of Christ, yes, we love one another. <laughs> we, are, we are a very hospitable, hospitable uh, a congregation, but we can always do more. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord. The church at Colossae was commended by Paul because of their faith and their love, which was so clearly evident to all. You know, for me, brothers and sisters, so encouraging when, I, when, I'm, when, I'm, when I'm worshiping. And I see my brothers and my sisters, they are worshiping God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind. The Hebrew writer tells us in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 24, he says, And let us consider one another in order to do what? To stir up love and good works. When I see my brothers and sisters and they are worshiping God, I could see their faith. Guess what it does for me? It encourages me. It encourages me. And what I do, I go back and tell people, you need to come visit the East Flushing Church of Christ. Amen. Amen. Paul continues and tells us in verse number 9, he says, We do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Paul continues and says, We are praying for you. We are praying for you constantly. We haven't stopped praying for you. And what he was praying for is that the church at Colossae will be filled with what? With knowledge, with wisdom, and what? Spiritual understanding. Amen. And from this, brothers and sisters, we can 
can draw the conclusion that the will of God is knowable. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. The will of God is knowable because there's a popular concept out there that God's will is unattainable. That you just can't know God's will. Scriptures are just too hard to understand. You need to have a PhD in theology to understand the word of God. Yes, it's out there. And Paul here is saying you can understand the scriptures. You can understand the will of God. I want you to be filled, he says, with, with what? With knowledge and wisdom and spiritual understanding. He would not have said that if he couldn't understand it. Therefore, it is something that is attainable. Amen. Paul made the same point in a similar way when he, when, he, when he wrote to the church at Ephesus that when the Holy Spirit came upon him, when the Holy Spirit revealed these things to him, what he did was he wrote it down. He wrote it down so that when we read the word, we may understand. Amen. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 3 to 4, Paul says, how by revelation he made known to me the mystery. So at one point, yes, there was a mystery. There was mystery in the word. There was a secret, if you will. But Paul says now there is no more mystery. And if you want to know the mystery, just read chapter 2. Right? There is no more mystery. He continues and say, as I have briefly written already, Verse 4, by which when you do what? When you read, you may understand. Amen. You want the mystery? Everybody's like, what's the mystery? It's just simple. It's that the Gentiles and the Jews are one in Christ. When Christ died on the cross, he broke that dividing wall of hostility and made the two one. The Gentiles now are part of, if you will, that branch. That's just the mystery. Right? So now he says there's no more mystery. God revealed his, his will through the Holy Spirit, which was revealed to the apostles and the prophets. And the apostles and the prophets, they wrote it down so that when we read the word, we may what? Understand it. Amen. God's will is knowable. Don't need to be afraid, afraid of God's word. Praise the Lord. First John 1, 1 John 5, verse number 20. The Bible says, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us what? Understanding that we may know him who is true. That's the word of God. In John chapter 8, verse 32, you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. Amen. And I think that's an important reminder for us, brothers and sisters, to know that it's a fantastic thing. We are at an advantage, praise the Lord. We don't need to step back and wonder, what is God's will? We don't need to do that. Can you imagine you're going to work? Right? Going to work and you're wondering to yourself, what does my boss want me to do today? Mm. <laughs> that would not be a, a good feeling. Nobody wants to uh, wander around for eight hours asking myself, what should I do today? You know what? Maybe I should just paint the ceiling. <laughs> Maybe I'm just going to go and just uh, fix the toilet. Mm. I, I spoke to a young lady um, recently. And I said, um, family member of mine. And I was like, um, but no, so what does your job entail? And, and, and she was like, you know what, I just, I just go to work and just, um, just, you know, just do stuff. <laughs> and I was like, I know, for me, I can't do that. <laughs> right? I, I, I need structure. I don't want to go around and be like, all right, um, today I'm just going to fix the roof. <laughs> right? That would not be very productive, if you will. No child wants to be in a situation where they have no idea what their parents want. We want to know what's my duties, amen? What is my responsibilities? What is right? What is wrong? And guess what? God has done that for us. Praise the Lord. God has done that for us. Now I must admit, church, 
that yes, there are some hard scriptures in the Bible. There are some difficult scriptures in the Bible sometimes. It's challenging, I should say. That's the word. Peter tells us in, in, in 2 Peter 3, verse 16, that unstable men misuse these scriptures to their own destruction. Right? But if we pray, amen, if we ask God for wisdom, James 1, verse 5, and we search the scripture daily, Acts 17, 11, like the Bereans, God will give us the what? The understanding. Let the church say amen. amen. Faith comes by hearing. hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. God tells us to what? In 2 Timothy 2.15, I believe it is. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman is not to be ashamed, rightfully dividing the word of truth. It's going to take some effort. Amen. amen. It's not just going to come just like that. It's going to take a little effort. So we're going to be doing our study on how to study the Bible. Amen. That is good. I'm, I'm excited. Because we, 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 yes, we could read the, the Word of God, but we want to have a, a, a way of how to approach it. To bring it all together. Amen. He continues in verse number 9. Stick with me. And he says, I'm praying that you may be filled with the knowledge of, of, of God's will, all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Let me say this church, knowing God's will is supposed to lead to something. Amen. The point of receiving God's will and knowing God's will is not so that you can have an academic pursuit. Amen. It is not so that I can say, you know, brother, I've memorized the entire book of Hebrews. And I can quote it from the beginning to the end. That's nice. <laughs> and it's not so that I can impress my friends. Guess what? I know the Hebrew and I know the Greek. Guess what? I even learned Spanish. <laughs> I even know Espanol. <laughs> there is an outcome that this is supposed to lead to. Amen? And it's supposed to lead us to have the ability to take the principles and the teachings of God and apply it to our circumstances in our lives. Amen. Amen. Do, you not, do you not know people are not really interested in hearing how much Greek and Hebrew you know? <laughs> and how much, you can, or how much books you can memorize? Guess what? It's good that you can do these things. But people want to know how can the scripture change my life? How can it help me in my day-to-day -day life? How can it change me? Again, I'm not saying that it's not good to know all these things. You can memorize the 66 books of the Bible. That'd be nice, right? But God wants us to know his will so that we, they can be useful to us in application to our daily life. How can it help me to change who I am? And the church say amen. amen. And that's why Paul wants us to know the will of God. So that... Verse number 10, we may walk worthy. Mm -hmm. We may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. Here Paul talks about the word, uses the word worthy. Verse 10. Now notice Paul did not say we are worthy of God. Because guess what? We are not. None of us are worthy of God. None of us deserve God's mercy and God's grace. As a matter of fact, grace is an unmerited favor. Amen? Yes? Mm -hmm. Ephesians 2, 8, 4 is by grace that we are saved through faith, not of ourselves, verse 9, it is a gift of, gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. We don't deserve it. We're not worthy. But what Paul is saying is because of what God has done for us, because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, because of that we are, we appreciate him. We appreciate God. We are going to make it our duty to do what? To change our lives. Amen. And respond to God's will in faithful obedience. Romans chapter 12 verse 2, do not be conformed to the world, right? But be transformed. 
by the renew of our minds. Amen. We can't be perfect. Yes. We know that. We can't be perfect, but guess what? We can be faithful. Let the church say amen. Enoch was faithful. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 11, 5, that before he was taken, he had a testimony that pleased God. That's what it means to walk worthy. Not perfection, but faithfully pleasing God in our day-to-day -day life. Amen. Let the church say amen. And then he gives us a number of pictures of what a life pleasing to God looks like. Stay with me. And the first thing that he says is that a life pleasing to God will always do what? Will always bear fruit. Notice verse number 10, the latter part of it. Being fruitful in every good work. When you're living a life that's pleasing to God, your life will always produce fruits. Amen. Amen. And your fruit will be so obvious that others will see it. Amen. Amen. Others will see it. They can't keep it to themselves. And they will tell others about it. Amen. Amen. That's what happened to the church of Colossae. When the, the, they spread the gospel to others. Others will be able to look at your life, look at your actions, and see the result of a fruitful life. Listen, church, Brother Jenkins had mentioned this morning. There is no way, if you are applying God's word in your life, that you will not see positive results. Amen. It's impossible. It's impossible to pick up that book, study it, and it does not change your life. There will always be fruits in the life of a Christian that's living righteously. Now, the Bible describes bearing fruit in a number of ways. It is described as good deeds, Matthew 5, 16, right? That your lives will shine before men, that they may see your good works, right? Deeds. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 5, 9, the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, right? Deeds, right? It's, it, it's, it's described as praising and honoring God. We're talking about bearing fruits. Hebrews 13, verse 15, therefore, by him let us continue to offer a, a, a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips. Right? We did it this morning. We're praising and we're singing to God. Loved it. And it's also described as bringing another disciple to Christ. A fruit is another disciple. That is John 15, verse 16, and that your fruit should remain. But it's never described as just something that's just internal. It's not just saying, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the Holy Spirit. No. There is going to be such a dramatic, drastic change in your life that you'll be able to look at yourself and see the result of that transformed life. There's going to be some change. There's going to be some fruits. Amen. And it will not only be evident to you, but it's going to be evident to others around you. As I have said. The second picture that Paul gives us in verse number 10. When it comes to walking worthy. Is one. Bearing fruits. Yes. Second. Increasing in the knowledge of God. He's talking about spiritual growth here. There is some maturing that has to, be take, uh, has to take place. In the life of a Christian. And over time, as we continue to study, continue to apply the word of God to our life, you're going to grow. Right? You're going to get to know the word of God better. And the person you are in 2023, amen, will not be the person you are in 2024. There's going to be some, some increasing of knowledge. There's going to be some growth. And that's what God wants. Amen. And that's why I'm so excited for this This. this we're going to be studying the Bible. Amen. I'm excited. Right? You know, it would be a sad thing to see an adult still drinking on a bottle, still sucking on a pacifier, still wearing diapers, 
acting like a newborn baby. And yet, sometimes, we can do the same thing. That is where we are stunted in our spiritual growth. And Paul says that can be. Amen? There must be progress. There must be steps taken to move forward in our Christian life. There's a saying, when you stop growing, you start dying. When you stop growing, you start dying. God wants us to grow, amen? First Peter chapter 2 and verse number 2 through 3, we know these scriptures. As newborn babies, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Amen. And you have tasted that the Lord is good. Amen. Amen. So therefore, we should desire that pure spiritual milk. What is that pure spiritual milk? He's talking about the word of God. The more we spend in the word, the more we allow it to change our life, is the more that we will grow. Amen. The third thing that Paul wants us to see when it comes to walking worthy is not only we're going to bear fruits, it's not only that we're going to increase in our knowledge, but also we are going to be strengthened in with all um, his might. We're going to be strong Christians. Amen. Right? Whenever we go to the gym, that's nothing. Right? With, with how God strengthen you spiritually. Amen. Mm -hmm. Alright? We're going to be strengthened with all his might. Notice the verse number 11. Paul says, Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. Amen. In other words, Paul says, Your faith will be so strengthened in the Lord. There are times when we need God's strength. Amen. Sometimes we're weak. And we need God's strength to help us in our daily walk with God. To deal with the problems. Don't focus on problems, right? That we go through in our life. Sufferings that we go through in our life. Right? On a regular basis. Let me say this, church. The more we draw close to God, the stronger our relationship will be with God. Amen. And the stronger our relationship with God is the easier it is to get through life difficulties. Amen. James tells us in James 4 and verse number 8, he says, draw close to God or draw nigh, King James. Draw close to God and he will draw close to you or draw nigh to you. Or James is the King James Version. <laughs> the picture is painted with God next to us, giving us strength. Giving us strength to triumph over our difficulties that we go through in our life. Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3, we're about to close. He says our, his divine power, his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us by his glory and his virtue. Amen. We have been given everything that we need to live this life. Amen. The tools that we need to overcome the trials that we go through, to strengthen us, to be able to overcome the difficulties in our lives. And we have given the blueprint to make it to heaven. Amen. Can the church say amen? amen? I asked the question earlier this morning, and I'm asking it again. When you pray for a brother or a sister in Christ, what do you pray for? What do you pray for? Paul and Timothy... They prayed for the church at Colossae. And what they prayed for was the church to be filled with the knowledge of God. They want them to work, walk worthy of God. They wanted them to bear fruits. They wanted them to increase in their knowledge of God. And they also prayed that the church would be strengthened with, with all God's might to stand on the life difficulties. That's a wonderful prayer, isn't it not? When you pray, what is your contents of your prayer for your brother, for your sister? I'm going to say this. I am very, very happy. 
I am happy to know the church. Pray for me. Amen. Amen. Brother Jimmy always said, pray for me, right? Because it's important, right? Because I know that there are days when I can't pray. Overwhelmed with, with the stress of life. And I know that somebody is doing what? Is praying for me. When I can pray for myself, I know that you are praying for me. And when you can pray, I'm praying for you. We are praying for each other. As the songwriter says, somebody pray for me. They had me on their mind. They took the time to pray for me. I'm so glad they prayed. I'm so glad they prayed. I'm so glad they prayed for me. Jesus prayed for us as well. Didn't he not? He prayed for the apostles and he prayed for us that we all may have unity. Amen. I have prayed that you all were encouraged this morning as we continue to study the Bible, as we continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Savior Jesus Christ. God tells us in in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That is how we're going to really be able to see what God wants you to see. Is that one, it comes through hearing and hearing by the word of God. One must believe, Hebrews 11, 6, how without faith it's impossible to please God. And he that comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a reward of those that earnestly seek him. One must repent, Acts 17, 30, and change of mind. One must confess that he the Ethiopian unit dead. One must be baptized, 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, and one must be faithful until death. When Jesus Christ comes back, he's promised that heaven will be your home. You will be a part of that feast forevermore.